Hello, hello, and we're back. Thank you for joining us now at 1045. I'll let everyone finish taking their seats. And uh, once again, my name is Maggie McAlpine. I'm the Cyber Engagement Lead for the Center for Threat and Form Defense at MITRE Ingenuity. And I am proud and incredibly pleased to invite two actually pretty good friends up. This is Cecilia. Um, they're going to be speaking about Miko Hupanen's book, uh, If It's Smart, It's Vulnerable, which I have sitting on my shelf, specially signed. It's going to be worth a lot of money someday. Um, does any, who else here has a copy of the book already? Miko's book. Yeah, yeah, you did the homework. You read the assignment. Uh, I'm sure you guys are going to have fantastic questions for Miko and Cecilia. And when you do, make sure to use the microphone because we are being recorded. Um, and I think this is the perfect time to invite them up. Cecilia and Miko Hupanen, uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. So. Maggie, you're awesome. Thanks, girlfriend. So, yeah, it's so good to see you guys. And I will... Uh, you know, let you guys kick this off, I think. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody from RSA Conference. I feel so blessed to be here today with all of you and with Miko. So I am very lucky to have known Miko a, a very long time. It's pretty crazy. Um, Miko, uh, I have an electronic book copy, so Miko just gave me one of my signed copies on a punch card. So any of you that want some pu signed punch card afterwards, that's great. For those of you that have not met Miko Hippinen, which is very hard, and I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Yeah, it's close enough. Okay, it's close enough. We're working with it. You sound like a native. <laughs> so for those of you that have met him, it's very hard to introduce somebody who's been in the industry for so long. So Miko has been in the industry since 1991, and in fact, his book actually covers a lot of that. He's written for the New York Times, Wired, Scientific American, and he works in Finland, as the chief research officer at With Secure and as the principal research advisor at F Secure, which is where I met him ages ago. Mm. So, Miko, welcome to RSA Conference. Thank you very much, Cecilia. Thank you for having me, and thanks to all of you for showing up. Yes, and find seats, guys. There's some, some, still some seats. Hang out with us. We're going to have a good time. This session is actually with you guys, so we're going to do a little bit of the reading of the book. But it's for you. If you want to have questions, I expect you to walk up to the microphone right here. It's a great opportunity to meet Miko and have him answer your questions directly. So Miko, let's just get started and going back all the way to, uh, let's go back to the, the time when you were talking about brain virus. So you met two Pakistani brothers and they had created this brain virus. This is when hacking was actually more, uh, less nefarious, I'll say. Mm -hmm. So I was hoping you could give us a little bit of background how you met them, and then uh, maybe read a little bit out of the book. Sure, sure. So when I started doing cybersecurity or computer security um, in 1991, it was so different world. A great example of that is that when I started doing reverse engineering um, to understand how malware of the time worked, I collected all the viruses. I had a sample of every single computer virus which existed, and I reverse engineered all of them to understand the problem. Now, obviously, there's no way you could do that anymore. You haven't been able to do that for 20 years, but back then it was doable, which meant one of the early viruses I reverse engineered was the very first PC virus, Brain, from 1986. And then when Brain turned 25 years, we were discussing that we, we should do something about it. And one of the things we wanted to do was to go and actually meet the people behind it, because I had a pretty good idea who wrote the virus, because there's an address inside the virus code, inside the boot sector of the virus code. And when, when I say boot sector, I mean this. This here is a floppy infected by brain.a from 1986. When I analyzed it, I found a, an address. So I'll read a segment from the book about actually going to Pakistan to find the people who wrote the virus. So. We flew from Helsinki, Finland to Abu Dhabi. After that, from Lahore, landing to Lahore, Pakistan airport at 2.30 a.m. in the morning. From the plane windows, you could see the warm rain outside. The terminal emerged from the mist as the plane taxied onward. Once inside the terminal, we noticed that it was crammed with people as if it were midday. We collected our bags and cameras, cleared the passport control, and started looking for the bodyguards I had reserved. Our SIM cards couldn't connect to the Pakistani operator's network, and it was difficult to locate anyone in the crowd. 
Finally, we spotted a man in a leather jacket carrying a piece of paper that said, Mr. Mikko. He introduced himself to us as Yasir. Yasir led us outside to a slightly beat up Toyota minibus. Our driver sat at the wheel and next to him was our bodyguard, a Pakistani police officer in full uniform and armed with a pistol. Yasir explained that the three of them would escort us around Lahore during our visit and made us swear not to go anywhere without them. He then asked if he could pay their fee. I said yes and asked if he would take cash in US dollars or in euros. Dollars were fine. So I gave Yasir $300 bills and asked if he could write me a receipt. His answer was no. <laughs> We got into the van and we were taken to our hotel. Morning had almost arrived. Tight security around hotels is common in many Asian countries. In Malaysia and Indonesia, for example, it's not uncommon for security to, to check a vehicle's underside with mirrors before allowing anyone into the hotel. However, our hotel Ahari in Lahore was in a class of its own. There was no way of driving into the hotel's yard from the street Sandbags and concrete barriers had been used to build a winding route that could not be bypassed. The hotel's guards checked our passports and examined our vehicle every time we were let go through. Inside, the hotel was magnificent with massive chandeliers on the ceilings of the lobby. We checked in, the receptionist gave me my key and then remarked that the hotel had a hidden bar in room 119. Pakistan is a Muslim country and locals are banned from consuming alcohol. The ban doesn't apply to foreigners, but the idea is to keep alcohol out of sight. So later, I had a look around room 119, and indeed, in, and indeed there was a hidden bar, a speakeasy if you will. From the corridor, the room appeared similar to all the others, but the door was slightly open. And behind the door, there's a small bar with a smiling bartender, and short-haired, huge men who sat at the tables, speaking in American English and swallowing Budweiser's by the bottle. Their gray suits bulged suspiciously, like this, as if they all had holsters and handguns. Later, during the trip, we heard that the CIA was using the hotel to accommodate their consultants, and that explained the Budweiser men and their tight security. The next day, our van took us to Nissan Block, to the other end of the city. As I stepped out, the feeling was unreal. The address that I had found in the boot sector of an infected floppy was an actual location. I was at Nissan Block 730, looking at a gray two-story building, and the door said, Brain Telecommunication Limited. Okay, so just going back there for a second. This is... How many years after the brain virus was out? 25 years. 25 years later, the, the actual company still existed. I think what was nice about listening to Mika Reed is it's a really open way to hear the story and to hear about the people that were there. I think that the two brothers, the other part that really struck me in that was that the two brothers were actually doing this as not necessarily to, uh, to call out IBM, but actually, more importantly, to just let people know that this build awareness. And then when they got really famous, because it kind of got unleashed into the wild, they got scared. So maybe just a little bit of reflection on how those two brothers reacted to that. I mean, um, the brothers were technical people already back then. They had a long background with mainframe computers, and they were really horrified about this new IBM PC system, which had no security at, it, at all, which is true, it, it didn't. So they wanted to prove what could happen with this new system with no security framework of any kind. And to prove it, they wrote this virus, which then went worldwide and really started the PC virus problem, which is the problem we are still fighting today. And it was sort of interesting when I asked the brothers about their experiences with more modern malware. They've, they've been infected multiple times themselves, so they were hit back by the very problem they started. But we have to remember, these guys were not criminals. They broke no laws because there were no laws about any of this in 1986. 
you know, that time seems so innocent. Um, and those of you who are as old as Miko and I <laughs> have a memory of that time where, you know, you had script kiddies that were out there just trying to build a name for themselves. Um, but I have another reflection back on in 2010 when we started to see a change, not just a change in technology or a change in user behavior, but actually a change in connectivity. It's where we really started to build connections to each other. At that point, around that time, you coined the term, which is where your book come from, and this is where you gotta lift it up and show everybody what the book looks like. <laughs> if it's smart, it's vulnerable. Can you share a little bit about the history behind how this came about and why this took off? Well, they call it the Hyppönen law. I, I originally mentioned this during some keynote some, at some conference and it just stuck. People get repeating it and it, it became known as the Hyppönen law. <laughs> and it is a very, very pessimistic law, but it's also true. As we add functionality and connectivity into everyday devices, they become vulnerable. When we make everything programmable, everything becomes hackable. And this revolution is only in the very beginning. I mean, so far we've seen, yeah, sure, tons of smart devices. That's just the beginning because all the stupid devices will be online as well. And the example I always use about the law is my wristwatch. This is my Omega, which actually, funnily enough, we used to have a, uh, a, a tradition in the company, which is that after the first 10 years working at the company, you get an Omega watch. Why? Because the very first virus I ever analyzed, the very first virus we ever named in the company was Omega, because it showed the Omega sign on the screen, and which means, of course, I should have named the first virus Ferrari, because then everybody would get a Ferrari after the first <laughs> 10 years. But this is a mechanical watch. There's not a chip inside of this watch. You have to wind this watch. There's no code. There's no CPU. There's no connectivity, which means it's completely unhackable. And then when we look at smartwatches, many of us are having smartwatches right here in the audience, they might be hard to hack, but of course they are hackable, they run code, they are online, there's connectivity, there's functionality, and this will apply to everything. Everything will go online, and eventually the internet grid will be exactly as necessary for our societies as the electricity grid. Yep. And there's nothing we can do to stop this revolution. It's gonna happen whether we agree or not. So fast forwarding a little bit up to more like the last five years, you know, the, things have been rapidly evolving and our adversaries are as well funded as nation states and the largest organizations. What's the impetus and the change? What do you see changing in the overall marketplace? There's more and more money in malware. Again, when I started 30 years ago, nobody was making money with viruses or malware. That basically started in 2003. So the, for the last 20 years, money has been the main motivation for malware writers. It's not the only motivation. Of course, we have nation state attacks, espionage, cyber war. We do have hacktivists or um, patriotic hackers who do hacking for some other purpose than making money. But when we, for example, look at the inflow of samples coming into our labs today, around 98% of the samples we analyze are coming from organized online crime groups, and they do everything they do to make money. And as these groups have become more powerful and especially more wealthy, they can invest more into their attacks. As an end result, we have these more and more organized crime groups which resemble traditional organized crime more every day. They have organizational structures, they have middle managers, they pay monthly salaries to professional hackers, they have physical offices, they have their own data centers, they hire lawyers, they hire business analysts. So it is really becoming completely organized and completely professional type of crime. Organized cybercrime um, by organized crime. You know, coming into this, you're now in Silicon Valley where we have, you know, we talk about unicorns all the time. Mm. You kind of coined the term, the, the term cybercrime unicorns. So I'm kind of curious, do you feel like those cybercrime unicorns, as well-funded as they are, now that you're seeing them become more, and I want to say legitimate in the sense that they've built out business structures, do you see that this is going to continue to trend this way? Or do you feel like there's been some shift happening a little bit with the governments coming down and taking down ransomware gangs? Hmm. 
initially the whole term cybercrime unicorn was more like a joke because five years ago it wasn't realistic. However, it's not funny anymore. It, it has become more and more real. When you look at the, the largest groups, Lockbit, Alpha, Klopp, you look at the revenue they've been making for years, which has been increasing, maybe doubling year by year, and you add on to the fact that these groups don't keep their wealth in dollars or euros or not even in rubles. No, they keep it in Bitcoin. And it, they had a sizable amount of Bitcoins already five years ago, which had then increased in valuation hundredfold or thousandfold. That's one of the big sources of their wealth. And that makes them powerful and that makes them scary. And then when we have, um, then when we look at the only nation state that's doing actually attacks where they're trying to make money, we have to look at North Korea. When we look at attacks from nation states, it's always about either espionage or sabotage. Most of the na nation state activity is about stealing information. So espionage, some of it is, is building sabotage, like Stuxnet, the, the seminal example, or you know, um, cyber war examples we've seen over the last seven years in Ukraine as Russia has been waging cyber war against Ukraine. But then there's the exception that that's North Korea. North Korea is the only country in the world which has done both ransomware attacks, but also hacking into cyber, uh, sorry, cryptocurrency exchanges and other similar systems to try to make money. How come a country is trying to make money with ransomware? Because they're trying to fix their budget deficit. It's a very poor country which has been sanctioned the only way they can really make sizable amounts of money is with crime. And today, cybercrime makes a lot of money. And they get the proceedings in Bitcoin, which are very hard or even impossible to sanction. So it makes a lot of sense. The biggest successes yeah. against these cybercrime gangs we saw a year and a half ago after the uh, JBS and Colonial Pipeline attacks here in USA, US State Department started offering $10 million bounties for Russian cybercrime gangs. As an end result, we saw more arrests into the biggest cybercrime gangs than we've ever seen in history. Unfortunately, all that ended in February 2022 when the war reignited from Ru as Russia invaded Ukraine and that changed everything. Do you want to talk a little bit about like the change of cyber warfare? I mean, we you've thought about detente before, but what do you think or do you want to read about it out of your book? Mm. <laughs> I know you talk specifically about cyber warfare. Sure. There has been a much there has been a big change. Cyber weapons are interesting to governments and militaries because cyber weapons work. Cyber weapons make a lot of sense. Cyber weapons are effective, they're affordable. And they're deniable. Affordable, effective, deniable. That's a great combination in a weapon. That's a combination you don't get with any other kind of weapon. The end result then means that if you have to launch an attack against your adversary, if you do it in the real world, you can't deny it. If you do it in the online world, it's very hard to prove who actually did it. The, again, going back to the seminal example, Stuxnet, we know exactly who wrote Stuxnet. U.S. government together with the Israelis. However, I can't prove that. Like 13 years later, we still can't prove that. That's how good the deniability is. And this means that our conflicts and our wars have expanded into yet another new domain. Technology has always shaped the way we handle our conflicts, the way we fight our wars. 500 years ago, the only, to the only technology we had was swords and bows and arrows, then simple cannons. But then technology enabled warships, then warplanes, and war expanded from land to sea and to air. But these new innovations didn't make land war disappear. It just expanded to new domains, which means the last two domains, space and cyberspace, have done exactly the same. And that means that I don't think we'll ever see a cyber war between two countries which would only play out in the cyber realm. It's just one of the domains where these wars are being fought. Mm. Looking at Ukraine, it's being fought right now on land, on sea, in space, and in cyberspace. Right. The difference I think here is it's asymmetric. Like when you were talking about North Korea, that actually they never have to leave their borders. And the one big question that everybody always has is how there's a lot of jurisdictional ambiguity. How do you actually enforce laws? How do you, 
have people who are from different uh, countries that allow for criminal gangs to exist and and actually you know support them in ways that like turning a blind eye to actually change that front. Is there a way to do that? The thing that the internet revolution did to all of us is that it, it deleted geography. Mm -hmm. That's it in a nutshell. Internet deletes geography. It deletes geography in good and in bad. I mean, obviously, the upsides are huge. Today, all companies are software companies. Today, all companies can operate completely globally. The clients couldn't care less about where you're coming in the world. I can say this as a company coming out of a country of 5 million people. Finnish software companies operate all around the world, and nobody really cares where we're coming from. And that's great. It also enables us to find people like us all over the world, across borders, across time zones. No geography, no borders, no distances. That's excellent. But then the downside is that all the criminals can reach us regardless of where we are. There's no borders for the criminals either. There's no borders for the risks either. And this has completely changed the risk levels for us, especially for us living in fairly safe, civilized, uncorrupted countries. When we go online, we are not living in safe, civilized countries. We're online, and as victims, we are as close to these online criminals or attackers as anyone else, anywhere else in the world. And this is the big shift. And this has all happened during our lifetime, and it will never go back. And we have no global laws. So how do we fix this? How do we make global jurisdiction? How do we fight these problems? We have no global laws when we never will have global laws. And the thing that we are failing the hardest, the thing that would fix this the best, would really be in doing better in catching actual online criminals, getting them arrested, getting them to court, getting them sentenced, and getting them into jails. Because right now, that's where we are failing the hardest. And that is a huge problem because it shows that the potential newcomers into this field, especially people in developing countries who see these guys driving around in their Lamborghinis and they want to do the same. They have the skills, but they don't have the opportunities, so they go into life of online crime. We have to show them that crime pays, and it pays online as well. And that's where we are failing right now, and that's what we should be able to change. How? <laughs> like, this is going to be it, people. Write this down. This is the most important answer. <laughs> no, but honestly, like, how? Do you feel like this is going to be the only way it could happen is if we do go on to online currencies and then we can be tracing that? I mean, where, what could we do differently? The problem with technological innovations is that once we invent something, we cannot uninvent it. We cannot put the cat back into the bag. There's unlimited amount of examples of this. Internet brought us all these great things and all these downsides as well. We can't make it go away. IoT is doing the same thing. Encryption, this is the RSA conference. Encryption has brought us so many benefits for our online privacy and at the same time it completely enables criminals and extremists and terrorists to go uh, unscathed online. Cryptocurrencies. Uh, Monero, for example, which is much more anonymous than Bitcoin. Most of the use of Monero I see is, is all about uh, criminal use of, 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 like, most of the online, uh, online drug trade, for example, happens in Monero. And we cannot make these things go away. Once they've been invented, they are here to stay. And we often speak about these technologies as if they would be innocent, that it's just a tool. It's, it's, it's like a hammer. You can use hammer for bad or for good. Well, that's sort of like a lazy, lazy reply to a very real problem. We have a responsibility about the innovations we do. and We can't just explain them away that they could be used for good as well. It's true. You can use these for good and bad. But it's, 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 it goes way beyond that. We, we really should think about the responsibility we have for the technical innovations we make as well. So when the U.S. State Department started putting out these $10 million bounties for groups like Revil or dark side. Um, I actually did a couple of talks in different conferences where I was speaking about the cybercrime unicorn hunting season. We had a hunting season for a couple of, couple of bright months, starting from September 2021 all the way to February 2022 when the war broke out in Ukraine. During that time, it looked like we were going to the right direction. Mm -hmm. And now we are going back to the wrong direction, unfortunately. However, there's some bright news about 
Um, not about ransomware, but BEC, business email compromise, uh, or CEO scams, which is one of the largest problems in uh, money-wise after ransomware. There's actually been great projects coordinated by Interpol of actually arresting uh, scammers, especially in, in Africa, yeah. which actually have been uh, taken to court and have been sentenced. So there's some uh, bright examples of law enforcement, international law enforcement, being able to find criminals and actually put them behind the bars. Yeah, I mean, there was a recent one that was international and you saw the FBI coordinating with people in other countries and they were able to pull down uh, ransomware gangs. I, I, this is uh, for you guys as well. So I still have a couple questions up here, but I'd love for you guys to join me in asking Amiko any questions. So um, we were talking a little bit about um, the cyber warfare and the race to the bottom. Can you talk any more about like what's happened with the Ukraine war different from 2014 to today? And where do you see international uh, or organizations and groups working together to kind of help the Ukrainians, for example? Mm. Obviously, Ukraine needs all the help we can give to Ukraine right now. So I live in Helsinki. I live 100 miles from the Russian border. Both my grandfathers fought the Russians in the Second World War. We have a very big and very unpredictable neighbor. I also come to you um, from the newest NATO. NATO member country in the world. Congratulations. Yeah. Let's raise it. Finland just joined. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. We, we just doubled the NATO border with Russia. Congratulations. <laughs> so the conflict um, is very complex. But looking at just the cyber part, I could easily claim, and I could actually prove it to you, that Ukraine is the best country in the world defending their critical infrastructure against attacks from the Russian government. Ukraine is the best, better than Finland or Germany or France or United States or anyone else. Why? Well, in Finland we have a reserve system. I go back to the military regularly. Whenever we do rehearsals, we built these scenarios and we imagine how we would defend if Russia would do this or what would we do if the Russians would, did, would do this. We play make-believe. We play tabletop exercises. That's not what the Ukrainians are doing. Ukrainians have been fighting real cyber attacks from Russia since 2014. And the experience they've had over these years is what makes them the best. Russians have been successful in their attacks against Ukraine over these years multiple times. They've got power in their capital multiple times. The last time they tried, they failed. Because mm -hmm. Ukraine is learning and they have very powerful friends from the West. Security companies like ours, we try to help them as much as we can. The biggest technology companies in the world, like Microsoft and Alphabet, are putting a lot of resources behind Ukraine as well. Because we have to stop Russia. So that's the governmental part. The conflict is also unique because of the work of non-governmental actors. The IT Army of Ukraine, which operates inside Ukraine against Russia and has volunteers around the world supporting Ukraine against the Russia, is a great example of that. This is the first time in history when the vice prime minister of a country has been calling out for foreigners to come break your laws in your own countries to hack a country to support us in this war. And people have responded to that call and joined this common cause. Now, I don't recommend this to anyone, but I understand no. when people do it. I totally do. And then when we look at volunteers from the Russian side, there's now over 70 Russian volunteer groups uh, which are not part of the Russian government launching attacks against Ukraine and against entities in the West. Uh, groups like Hacksnet, Killnet, No Name 57 and more groups that didn't exist before February 2022, that appeared out of thin air when the conflict reunited. And these groups have been attacking critical infrastructure all across Europe and critical infrastructure here in the United States as well. For example, our uh, defense ministry has been attacked. Our, uh, when Zelensky, president of Ukraine, was addressing our parliament, the parliament website was attacked. And when our defense ministry went down, the website went down, my phone started ringing. Journalists in Finland were calling me up almost in panic. That, oh my God, Zelensky is speaking to our parliament and now the Russians are attacking our defense ministry. What does it mean? 
And I asked every single one of these journalists a simple question. When was the last time you visited the website of the defense, defense ministry? And of course, nobody ever goes to the website of the defense <laughs> ministry. It, it's clearly not critical infrastructure. It's just a website. It has nothing to do with the operational capability of the ministry, much, much less with the operational capability of our, of our military. But it's an attack on minds. It's an attack on heart. It feels bad when something like that happens. And that is information warfare at its core. And most of that is not being waged by Russian government. It's being waged by these volunteers. I think there is definitely blurry lines. And I'm super excited that we have a question. So I'm going to go to the question. But just to finish this thought is that it's hard when you see something from outside and you want to give and you want to volunteer and you want to help. But at the same time, like then we are crossing over again into that jurisdictional ambiguity of do we sit in a social structure and a construct that we all agree to? This is how the rules are played. Or do we help out? And, it, and it's blurry. Yep. It's very blurry. All right. So let's our first question, people. Let's give our hand. <laughs> Okay, um, so my name is Jen, I work for AWS. Um, and my question kind of gets to, it's hard to continuously evaluate and determine risk. And so one of the things you were talking about was bringing um, the cyber criminals organizations to justice. And uh, that can be really hard. Uh, typically the story has been told because it's Bitcoin and all the transactions are anonymous. But we've started to see some success. There was uh, an article in the Wall Street Journal last week mm -hmm. um, about uh, chain analysis, a company that was able to analyze the blockchain and from that be able to figure out who individuals were um, and then from that be able to make arrests. Do you see that as an area of additional research and expansion? Because I know, as you said before, there are other things that are have a bit more anonymity, but those are really interesting problems um, for people to really think about and unlock because we have such greater amounts of computing power. Yeah. Thank you. Great question. And the article you referred to in Wall Street Journal about Chainalysis and the work they do was really, really great. It really covers how the Bitcoin blockchain is a public ledger of every single transaction that has happened in the Bitcoin blockchain since 2009. Uh, yeah, 2009. Amazing how long it has been. Yeah. And every single one of those transactions is unchangeable forever and public forever. And you can do research work figuring out how money movements have been happening over all those years. We often say that for a company or organization to get hacked, you only have to make one mistake and somebody can get into your network or into your systems. Well, the same thing applies to criminals as well. All the criminals have to do is to make one mistake and then we can catch them. One mistake in you know, in the Bitcoin blockchain movements or one mistake, not hiding their real world IP address or something like that. that. That's the bright side. Now, criminals know this and they try to work around it. That's why I mentioned Monero earlier. Mm -hmm. So, for example, nowadays, Bitcoin is the way ransomware gangs collect their money. But once they get Bitcoins, then they use transactions to move them from Bitcoin blockchain to Monero blockchain, which is not public. It's a double blind blockchain, which is... Well, you can see every transaction in a different way. It's, it's much, hard, much harder to track money movements over there. And then they can move their money back from Monero to, let's say, Zcash. And from Zcash back to Bitcoin and from there to somewhere else. And the core problem we have with these new cryptocurrencies is that they are currencies based on math. Mm -hmm. Real world currencies are not based on math. Real world currencies are based on nothing. They're based on politics, which is the reason why we can print more money. We can print more dollars or euros if you feel like it. You can't do that with these cryptocurrencies, which means you cannot regulate them. You cannot regulate cryptocurrencies. It's like trying to regulate the, I don't know, the value of pi. You know, pass a law which says pi is not 3.14, but it's 4.14. That law wouldn't change anything. It would just be empty talk. Exactly the same thing applies to these currencies based on math. The only thing you can regulate is transactions moving these virtual currencies to real world currencies. And there's less and less need to do that because the online cryptocurrency uh, marketplace or ecosystem has become so big that you can do almost anything. You can live with that kind of money without converting it into real world money. So big you challenges. Still have to, like every time you're going to still have to go into the real world. So you want to buy an apartment? <laughs> 
even if you can buy it with Bitcoin, you're going to have to be able to. When the transaction happens into a traditional structure mm -hmm. is when I think the governments can find it. Yeah, yeah, and that's the hope we have. That's the only hope we have. Regulation anywhere else except in real world transactions or transacting, uh, converting those kind of currencies into real world currencies. That's the only place we can actually find anyone. Right, right. Good question. I want to ask a little bit about artificial intelligence. For those of you that were at the opening last night, um, we had a lot of talk about artificial intelligence. We have ChatGBT that's coming up here. Um, it is going to be a thread that's weaving through the entire conference. And I kind of want to get your feel on it. We've seen a huge shift in how people feel about it. And there's a difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence. Where do you see this happening? Where do you see the nefarious groups using it? And where can the good guys use it? Mm. So the word computer means to compute. Basically, it means to calculate. In many languages, the word for computer means to calculate or maybe to store data. For example, in Swedish, it's doctor, which means to store data. Mm -hmm. In Finnish, in my home language, a computer is a tietokone, which means knowledge machine. It's a machine which knows. Right. Now, I've spent my whole life with these tietokone machines, and they, have, they didn't know anything. They, they weren't really knowledge machines until the last year. You know what I'm speaking about. Finally, for the first time, we have these large language models which know stuff. Instead of using a search engine which will point you to places where the information is, we now have engines where we can ask questions and they know the answers. And the reason why they know the answers is that they are machine learning systems and we've taught them everything we know. We've given, or OpenAI has given GPT most of the books the mankind has ever written in any language. Mm -hmm. As an end result, GPT speaks all the languages I speak. It, it speaks better Finnish than I do. It speaks Finnish dialect, which is really weird. And it speaks all the programming languages I can program, which is really weird. So this is exciting and, and, and great and awful and scary at the same time. Sort of like what internet was when it came as well. Really great and really awful at the same time. We started building our first machine learning systems inside our company for building cyber security solutions in 2005, probably years before most other companies did. We kept it as a big secret because we were Finnish, but we didn't like to boast or, or use it for marketing or anything clever like that. But eventually, we did have um, our own machine learning systems, which today handle hundreds of thousands of cases every day. They know the difference between good and bad, are able to make the call, which is great. And all those years, for 18 years, we've been waiting for the attackers to make the same move. We've been waiting for attackers to start using machine learning frameworks to, for example, to create malware. Six weeks ago, I got an email. A virus writer had written a new virus, and he was so proud about his creation that he emailed me. The virus in question is called LL Morpher. It's the very first piece of malware we've ever seen, which uses a large language model to rewrite its code every time it replicates to a new file. The author of this virus is called, known as SPTH. He's an old school virus writer who's not interested in money. He's interested in the challenge. He writes completely new kinds of computer viruses and publishes them on GitHub. The last major virus he wrote infects DNA. When you use DNA decoders to analyze DNA, it's actually able to infect that code which is decoded in these decoders, which sounds pretty scary. That's the kind of things he does. So what is LL Morpher? It's a Python worm. When it executes on a computer, it locates Python files and copies its own functions into those files. When these files are moved to other computers, it replicates to other computers, and then to other companies, to other countries, so on. The kicker is that it's not copying its own functions straight off. It has English language descriptions of every single function. Then it uses an API call to ChatGPT and ask, asks ChatGPT 3.5 to write these functions for it. Write me a Python function which does this, 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 and this. And those are the functions which it copies to the files it infects. As an end result, every time it infects a new file, the code is rewritten. As an end result, it would be trivial for anyone to, to modify this to rewrite the virus in any other language. It doesn't have to be Python. This was six weeks ago. History happened six weeks ago. This is the very first large language machine learning model used in malware. 
it's not spreading in the wild, then again, it's on GitHub. Any one of you could go and download it right now. And it is only the very first step. We will be seeing more of this. And that's when we will see that the only thing which can beat a bad AI is a good AI. Okay, well, give some positive here. Give good eye. What does the good AI do? <laughs> I know, at least some people are. <laughs> right now, it's easy to see that the automation level of the largest um, cybercrime gangs is still pretty basic. It's awfully manual, surprisingly manual. You look at malware campaigns, let's say ransomware campaigns. Mm -hmm. Once they deploy the campaigns you, can, campaigns, you can see them like scanning the internet, finding vulnerable machines, sending out malicious emails. And when these scan attempts get blocked, their IP range is blocked, or when their emails are blocked, they register new domains, new IP ranges, create new websites. They do all of that manually. It's humans doing it. And all the reactions, the blockings, are coming from cybersecurity companies, and that's automated. So we have machine speed fighting human speed. That's the situation right now. That's a great situation to be in. Reaction times from defenders are much, much faster than what, what they are from the attackers. And this will soon end. Within, I'm guessing, months, we will see them start to automate their processes because they could easily automate all of this. And then their reaction times would go down from hours or minutes into seconds. And that's when we will see exactly who will win this race. It, now it's a little bit hard to forecast, but don't worry, we'll see it very soon. Okay, but it's a still, I don't feel positive here. I'm Sorry, like, <laughs> I, I get that a lot. Sorry. I know, I know. Well, so I want to go into, and, and like I said, you guys, we have about eight minutes left or nine minutes left. Um, and if you have questions, please come up and ask. But in your book, you talk about privacy is dead. And that to me, breaks my heart because we all have young people in this world that are getting online early and they are being exposed and tracked and I don't want to give up that good fight. So can you share a little bit about what you're thinking about privacy and is there a way that we can recapture some of, you know, beyond the GDPR? Mm. When the web came around, I set up the first website for our company in 1994. And I remember discussing this new web thing inside, in our lab. Like we were looking at these different websites. You know, they were, there were 17 websites in Finland. Yeah, great, let's look at these. And I remember chatting with the guys and girls that, you know, this is going to be a big thing. Eventually there's going to be thousands of websites, maybe, you know, 100,000 websites, who knows? There's going to be all kinds of services online, maybe newspapers, maybe weather report will be online, maybe even movies. And then someone said, that, hold on, hold on, like how, how are companies going to monetize that? Like how, how would you be able to have like services, like the weather report online? Certainly newspapers are not going to bring their services online without being able to make money. How, how are we going to pay for this? And of course, in 1994, we have no idea. So we guessed that there's going to be a payment button. There's going to be a button inside our browsers. I would like to read this news article. Click, and then you pay a cent or two cents or half a cent for the right to access whatever content you want to access. That was 1994. That was 29 years ago. We still don't have that button inside our browsers. There's still no built-in micropayment system anywhere. Instead, we came up with a completely new way of paying for content, which is track everybody on the whole planet, build profiles and dossiers of everybody, and use that to make mass marketing and advertisement systems on all of us. And as an end result, before our generations, the mankind had privacy. After our generations, we don't. Privacy died, and it died during our watch. We can try to reclaim some of that with regulations like the GDPR, but it's hard. Google is not a search engine. It's the biggest ad agency on the planet. And I really wish we would have gone the other route. I really wish I could pay for content with money instead of paying for content with my data. Okay, but I'm not giving up. Okay, you guys, I want you to know that even I'm up here with Miko, and I'm going to say, I think that we will be able to not just be forgotten online or find other ways, but I, I do believe that this is something that we as an industry can actually think through. So I'm going to come, I want to ask, is there anybody have any open questions? Does anybody want to raise their hand? Anybody want to ask about Miko's experience? His first time he found the bug, and I don't even know how to say it, is SB... 
Uh, so SPDH? Biff, yeah. yeah. You guys want to talk about that? Okay. Yay. Questions. Hey. <laughs> uh, I'm Dane from Select Equity Group. Uh, nice to meet you, sir. Uh, I just have one question. What is your outlook? on cybersecurity for the good and bad guys in the next like 50 years. Do you see the good guys taking over or the bad guys? Oh, hmm. who's gonna He's win? It's super dark. Are you <laughs> asking that? Have you not listened to like the last three? <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. Who's gonna win in the long run? Um, there's not gonna be a winner. I've been a cybersecurity guy or a computer security guy all my life. Um, for years and years, I thought that my job is to secure computers. I'm a computer security guy, I secure computers. Slowly but surely I've started to realize that that's not my job at all. Over these decades our societies have changed. Everything is being run by computers. All organizations are being run by computers. Society expects everybody to be online. Every factory is being run by computers, which means our job has changed. Your job is not to secure computers. Your job is to secure the society. And that's a pretty big responsibility to be put on a group of geeks and nerds. And this fight will go on. Um, we will not be getting rid of cybercrime. There will be cybercrime as long as there are bad people on the planet. And there will always be bad people on the planet. That's the bad news. The good news, I guess there's job security in cybersecurity. Well, look around. These are the good guys. You're the good guys. So. Thank you for your work. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, so for instance, um, back in the day, right, bank robberies were very often and it's not anymore because sure. um, they put frameworks in place. They put all these controls in place. Don't you see that happening for cybersecurity? And, I'm, and I know my question is long, but an example would be that we moved to the cloud, right? So um, back then we had to spin up a server. We had to secure the physicality of that server. We have to configure it securely, right? Um, as opposed to being in the cloud, uh, Microsoft handles some of the stuff while we do, right? But do you see maybe in the next 50 years or so, uh, companies taking more of control of, of the environment that we use and that would eliminate the risk of individuals having to secure their own environment? There's actually some talk about the responsibility and liability question in the brand new cybersecurity strategy from the White House, which actually is worth reading. It's a good strategy. One of the key points is that we should take away the responsibility and liability from the individuals who can't handle the responsibility and put the responsibility to where it belongs. And it belongs to the companies building all these systems, to the software developers, to IoT companies building the insecure devices. And I like that. That might be one of the ways further, and that might be a game changer, something like that. So, yep, that, that's the good news. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, really inspiring to hear both of you. I'm a recovering diplomat, so I have to ask this. Because a lot of you alluded to the importance of uh, international cooperation. Since we're dealing with international problem, challenges, we need international response. Where do you see the role of cyber diplomacy? That is a hot topic now. Yeah. Cyber diplomacy would have sounded like a joke when I started my career. To get, today, it's, it's a very real thing. We do need global rules, global policies, and global diplomacy between countries. Since we have no global laws, and we never will have global laws, we have to have some level of norms and mechanisms for working together. All governments nowadays get it. Everybody realizes that cyber problems are very real. And there's actually a fight going on over the control of the internet. The only way to get that fight under control is to work together. And for that, we need diplomats. We need more decision makers who understand technology. We need more politicians who understand coding. We need more engineers as decision makers. And that's going to happen in the long run, but it's slow. Eventually, we will get there. And, uh, Regardless of everything I've seen in my career, I'm still an optimist. And the reason why I'm an optimist is that I believe it's too late to be a pessimist. Ooh. Write that one down because that's going to be his next law. And I actually agree with you. I mean, one of the things, one of the reasons that RSA conference is so important 
is we do bring in the diplomats and we bring in the people from the business side and we bring in the people from the government side and we're trying to make everybody have a conversation and cross fertilize ideas. So our last question, we have one minute and nine seconds. It's, you're up. <laughs> hey, I hope I can uh, keep it short. Um, you have a long career, started in the 90s. We're now in the uh, uh, second, uh, in, the, in the 20s of this century. Um, what keeps you motivated? Hmm. Wow. Great question. It's a great question. I when I was a boy, when I was 10 years old, my aunts and relatives would ask me, Mikko, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I always answered, I want to be a doctor. Mikko, why do you want to be a doctor? Because I want to help other people. Then I realized a little bit older that I can't actually look at blood. I don't like looking at blood. So you can't become a doctor if you can't look at blood. So I didn't become a doctor, but I did become, I don't know, a virus doctor of kinds. And I guess the reason is the same. And I think it's the thing that applies to almost everyone working in the cybersecurity field. We want to use our skills to help other people. So thank you for your work. Thank you for using your skills to help other people. And thank you for coming today. Wow, look at that with one second. Thank you.